Hello, everybody. This is uh, your professor, Ian. This is my video lecture on discourse communities, or as I also call this lecture, identity and rhetoric, because there's a, a complicated relationship between uh, your identity and uh, the kind of rhetoric that is persuasive for you or non-persuasive. Um, you know, so, so far in the course, we have discussed the classical appeals, kairos, ethos, pathos, logos, uh, in a really objective fashion, right? We're talking about these as, as though they're the same for everybody in every situation. But we have to ask, you know, how reasonable is that? Do people actually value the same facts? Um, I've definitely had arguments with people where we are looking at the same statistics and we value them differently or we interpret them differently. Uh, the same emotions, right? Uh, some people are definitely affected by different emotions in different situations, in different ways, right? The same credentials. Do I think someone from X university is is uh, 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 an, uh, an expert in something. Not always. Some people value different credentials and different educational backgrounds and that kind of stuff. So you know we we have to start by discussing the classical appeals in, classical appeals in an objective fashion. But now we need to think about the subjective reality, uh, right? Um, so if we think about this section from Trump's inaugural address from 2016. He said, uh, but for too many of our citizens, a different reality exists. Mothers and children trapped in poverty in our inner cities, rusted out factories, scattered like tombstones across the landscape of our nation, an education system flush with cash, but which, but which leaves our young and beautiful students deprived of knowledge and the crime and gangs and drugs that have stolen too many lives and robbed our country of so much unrealized potential. This American carnage stops right here and stops right now. Uh, so this is a the, the famous this is a famous section from his address, the American Carnage Address, people call it, um, and you can see that depending on your uh, uh, your feelings about Trump, your siding on in this election, you would interpret this this very differently because he's using these very um, clear appeals to pathos, right? This is a very sad and desperate scene he's painting here, but if you don't agree with his reading of America and you think he's being over the top. This is not going to be very effective rhetoric. However, if you agree with him and you think that America is in this dire position and you, um, uh, uh, you know, side with the Republican interpretation, his interpretation, then this is going to be effective rhetoric. This is going to stir your emotions and get you, um, you know, invested in what he's saying, right? You're going to actually believe there is American carnage. Whereas, again, if you don't agree with uh, Trump in this side of things, this is going to seem over the top, uh, exaggerated and ridiculous. So again, it depends on where you're coming from. You know, there's clearly, we can identify as students of rhetoric that, hey, he's making an appeal to pathos, but we need to think about, is that effective for the audience? Um, because nobody um, reacts to rhetorical techniques objectively. That's the thing, especially pathos, right? A pathos, pathos is meant to short circuit that objective, uh, objectivity that we, we strive for, right? Logos is meant to tie into objectivity, but even that, uh, depends on, you know, the, the facts that are being presented. Um, and we uh, form communities that share values and ways of using rhetorical techniques is how we negotiate the world or navigate the world, I should say. Um, and so this takes us to the idea of discourse communities. John Swales, he's a linguist, um, pretty well, as of the recording of this lecture, he's still alive. Uh, in 1990, he, he wrote uh, a, a book and, you know, popularized this term discourse community. He didn't come up with this term. It already existed, but he really developed uh, what we think of now as discourse communities. Um, and basically, discourse communities are groups that have goals or purposes and use communication to achieve these goals, right? So it's a very broad definition. And he, as we're going to see, he really drills down and expands on this to make it a more useful tool, because that in itself is not a very useful tool, right? So we're going to um, sharpen this tool a little bit right now. Well, let's start by thinking about a discourse community versus a speech community, because these are two ways that people talk about different kinds of uh, social communities in our society. So let's see, a speech community just refers to a community wherein every member shares the same spoken language. So, you know, we have uh, uh, English speech communities in America. We also have Arabic speech communities, uh, French, Spanish, all these different um, languages that people use uh, form a kind of, or we can think of as kind of speech communities. And of course, these are not necessarily by choice, right? You're born into a family that speaks a certain language, into a region, that, the, the language that's the language people speak. So it's not a choice thing, but it does lead to sociolinguistic groupings, 
with communicative needs, uh, such as socialization and group solidarity, right? So you have, uh, you know, Spanish language newspapers and television in America. You have um, English language uh, uh, television and newspapers. You have Chinese or Mandarin uh, language uh, television and newspapers in America, right? So, you know, there is a community built around that speech community, right? But it's very different because, again, it's not by choice. It's uh, just that everybody speaks that language and that there's a need to be catered to. Discourse community um, often uh, uh, focuses on written rather than spoken texts, right? So a lot of this, especially now, we can think about um, uh, the way the internet has helped create discourse communities and really uh, allowed platforms for various fringe and smaller discourse communities uh, that could have never survived or, or formed before the internet where, where you had this really um, easy way to disseminate written communication in this way, right? For people to search for specific information using, um, you know, the database technology of the internet. So uh, much stronger focus on written text, opt-in only, right? You have to join a discourse community. You're not born into a discourse community. Your family might be part of one. So your family's really into, uh, I don't know, um, uh, uh, Second Amendment stuff. They're, you know, hunters and they're into gun stuff, they're all part of the NRA, they're part of that discourse community, you might be brought into it, but you're not born into it, you have to join a discourse community, and therefore they're based on common interests only, right, you can have potentially a very diverse group of people speaking very various languages who are interested in the same interests, okay, so that's just the difference between discourse versus speech community, um, and I'm going to end this part of the lecture here, and I'll pick up with, um, you know, the as you can see on the next slide, six things that define discourse community. We'll drill into what a discourse community is a little bit deeper.